50%, attacked with a weapon, 55%, without a weapon, 55 child abuse, 35%, child sexual abuse below the age of 13, 39%, um, forced sexual contact, 33%. And if you take any of these and you say, does any, have anybody has a severe trauma, roughly 82% of this population has experienced this. And when I first saw these statistics, I was just absolutely amazed. But this is true, of, I'm afraid, of all large um, cities in the United States, and I really don't know about other countries, but certainly not Stockholm. <laughs> um, and there is almost a linear relationship between the number of traumas, these severe traumas, and the incidence or the PTSD score. So the more you have, <coughs> the more severe and the more trauma you have, the higher the incidence of PTSD. So this is a very, very prevalent problem in the United States and really across the world. And so Tanya has been working with a large group of um, people with PTSD or no PTSD, and we get these same kinds of findings. So they're afraid of AX, they're not of a, a BX is less so, AB is actually lower in this case for whatever reason, and it's not external inhibition. So external inhibition, as I said, is just presenting this novel QC in the presence of A, and that doesn't inhibit. People with post-traumatic stress syndrome generally have higher levels of fear to all cues, but importantly, they have absolutely no transfer on this transfer test. So again, we're picking up this core symptom of PTSD. But here's the most remarkable thing, I think. You remember the button box that I told you, where after every cue, we ask whether the, you know, the AQ, do they expect an air blast <coughs> or not expect it, and they don't know. So this, these are the data. These are the controls over here. So one means they absolutely expect that they're going to get air blast. Minus one means they definitely are not gonna, do not expect to get it. So the controls, roughly 50%, they think they're going to get the air blast. Minus 50%, in other words, they think they're not going to get the air blast. So that's quite, that's a huge discrimination. AB is certainly less than A, so that's condition inhibition. And AC, they don't expect much. But here are the people with post-traumatic stress syndrome. So these are the same people that show absolutely no inhibition of startle on that AB test trial, they have absolutely perfect cognitive awareness of the contingencies. And that's one real difference with startle and I think probably GSR to a large extent. GSR seems to follow the, the, the cognitive awareness of the contingencies, whereas startle is a much more primordial kind of measure of fear. Um, we think it's a very good measure because of that. So that person in Vermont that was coming out of the church, he knew he was in Vermont, not in Vietnam. He knew he was with his bride. He knew he had a white tuxedo on. He knew that he was in a safe situation. And yet when that primordial fear stimulus came on, he dove for cover. So we think we're picking up a major difference between the so-called cognitive awareness of these contingencies and this core disorder that we're really, we really think is tapping into the a fundamental, I think, the fundamental problem in post-traumatic stress syndrome. And of course, with PTSD, there's a high comorbidity with major depressive disorder. But it turns out that people with major depressive disorder, so they're afraid of AX, not so much of BX, great transfer on AB, <coughs> they actually look better than any of the other groups, even the no diagnosis group. But as soon as you have PTSD alone, or PTSD with major depression, you have no transfer. So it seems to be quite selective for PTSD. We haven't tested all kinds of other anxiety disorders. We tested major depression because, as I said, it has a very high comorbidity with, with um, PTSD. And now we have a monkey model that's really very, very similar. Um, this is really a big cage that I showed you. Underneath there is that accelerometer I didn't, call, didn't tell you. That's the transducer that puts out how much the animal startles. And so what we do is we pshht, and the animal startles. And um, then we pair a blast of air to his face, which they don't like. doesn't hurt him, but it doesn't like them. And when we do exactly the same test in monkeys. So again, they're afraid of AX. They're less of BX. Sorry, that didn't come through. This is over sessions. So they learn to discriminate. By the third, uh, third session, they've discriminated very nicely. And here's the test trial. So they're afraid of A. They're not afraid of A, uh, B. 
and AB, there's a nice transfer on that. So we can now measure this exact paradigm, and that's one of the other advantages of startle, is you can measure it in rats and people and monkeys. And we think, we don't know, but we think the neural circuitry is probably almost identical in all these species. Everything we've done in monkeys so far, <clears throat> we've extrapolated from rats, and it also goes back up to people. So monkeys can show this. Mm -hmm. um, I've been fortunate to work at the Yerkes National Primate Center, and before I got there, they had a very large pr uh, program because uh, early life stress, stress is such a risk factor for both major depressive disorder and PTSD that Charlie Nemeroff, when he was there, um, set up a large program uh, in people, and they did so at Yerkes. So they had 33 monkeys that we've had access to now, and the mother's taken out of the social group for variable times <coughs> a day, uh, two to three times a week, um, when the infants were from six, three to six months old. So that's the total manipulation. The infants stay with their siblings, they stay with their father, and so forth. Um, but this is a, quite a stressor because they're very close to their mother at that time, and a lot of these animals have a lot of deficits. Now what we're finding is indeed they're also showing a deficit. So this is a control animal. Um, the second day of training, they show good discrimination. They're afraid of AX, not afraid of BX, and later they showed very good transfer. We've now tested um, about 16 of these animals, and we haven't broken the code on the last uh, eight, I believe, but we found a couple of animals that were now maternally separated, that is, their mother leaves the um, colony for a little while, and they can't even learn that A is safe. So they're actually, for whatever reason, more afraid of BX than AX, and this is after nine days of training. So they can't even get that original discrimination, and we've seen that in some but not all monkeys. And we're genotyping all of these monkeys. So we think we have some animals that are resilient because they learn just as well as the controls, and others, um, maybe about 20% so far, which is kind of right, the rates of PTSD, that are showing the selective deficit, and that is they can't show um, inhibitory learning. <clears throat> so um, one of the problems with monkeys is, of course, they're very precious, um, scarce, and you can't just get another group of undergraduates in your psychology course or order another 20 rats like we do. Um, so you have to figure out ways that you can t test and train the animal over and over again. And this is what they do in memory research in monkeys all the time. They use sort of working memory kinds of tasks to study memory. So this has been sort of a, um, a fantasy of mine, and now NIH actually funded this with Jocelyn Bachevalier and I, and I've been fortunate to work with Jocelyn Bachevalier, um, and she's been looking at preferential looking at monkeys, and she has, <coughs> has a, a, a group of probably a thousand slides now that she knows monkeys can discriminate. So um, here's what she does. On day one, she'll have two cues, um, and the monkeys look at this, and they measure how much they look at both cues. The next day, they have a new cue and a familiar cue, and sure enough, the monkeys spend more time looking at the new cue compared to the old cue. And this is an old test of habituation that's been around forever. The point is that she now has a whole group of slides that we know monkeys can discriminate based on this particular test. So here was the fantasy, and now we're actually doing it and actually working in monkeys. So we have two cues, <coughs> A and X, and we pair that with the air blast. And then B and X and no air blast, so that's the safety signal. And then we put A and AB test trial. And now let's say we have um, a normal medial prefrontal cortex. So the question is, now what parts of the brain are involved in this safety signal learning? And how is it deficient in some of these animals that have early life stress? That's the big picture. And we're going to try to use this test in a sort of working memory way. So now we take another set of cues. We have these two cues. We pair them with an air blast. And now we have the same X and B with no air blast. So that's the safety signal. And now we put them together. But now let's say we inactivate the medial prefrontal cortex, either during the training phase or during the test phase, or the lateral septum, or the anterior cingulate, or any of a variety of other areas. 
And can we begin to pinpoint what part of the brain in the primate brain now is <clears throat> involved in normal safety signal learning, and then what happens in that part of the brain, perhaps, in those animals that have had this model of PTSD, namely early life separation. So um, that's where we're headed. And we can also do this, uh, Jocelyn is very interested in developmental studies, how early does this inhibition of fear develop in the primate um, species. So we're very um, happy about this because we can think we can really start to have a way to study this in the primate brain that it's modeling what we see in humans. So um, the second half of the talk, and more relevant probably to most of you, is our work with decycloserine and fear extinction and psychotherapy. And what I'm going to tell you now is that fear extinction is a new form of learning. I'll tell you what I mean by extinction. It's a new form of learning rather than erasure of that originally fear memory. It's dependent on the NMDA receptor, which has been implicated in learning and memory in the amygdala and maybe the prefrontal cortex. And because extinction is really at the basis of psychotherapy, um, <coughs> we have found that both extinction and psychotherapy can be facilitated by a partial agonist of the NMDA receptor called D-cycloserine. So what do I mean by extinction? Well, let me just um, phrase this again with a quote from Vietnam. Vietnam was a very significant war in our country, as you may understand by now. Um, and it goes like this. I can't get the memories out. So this is, again, a Vietnam veteran. Um, these are all true stories. I can't get the memories out of my mind. The images come flooding back in vivid detail, triggered by the most inconsequential things. Last night, I was having a good sleep for a change. Then in the early morning, a storm front passed through, and there was a bolt of, of <coughs> crackling thunder. I woke instantly, frozen in fear. I'm right back in Vietnam in the middle of the monsoon season at my guard post. I'm sure I'll get hit in the next volley and convinced I will die. My hands are freezing, yet sweat pours from my entire body. I feel each hair on the back of my neck standing on end. I can't catch my breath and my heart is pounding. I smell a damp sulfur smell. Suddenly, I see what's left of my buddy Troy. His head is on a bamboo platter, sent back to our camp by the Viet Cong. Propaganda messages are stuffed between his clenched teeth. The next bolt of lightning and clap of thunder makes me jump so much that I fall to the floor. Well, these are the awful, terrible memories in the minds of all soldiers in all wars, all throughout history. And I used to present um, to medical students at Yale, who are a very unruly group of, <laughs> of students. Um, I would have a psychiatrist present somebody with post-traumatic stress syndrome. And there would be 100 people there, and they were just riveted by the stories that these people told, because they were out, so far out of normal life experience. And, um, and you could see the deadly consequences of constant nightmares, flashbacks, <coughs> memories of this tra traumatic event. So all these things that you know, are associated with Vietnam, or whatever war it is, um, are triggers for flashbacks. And so the question is, can we use our knowledge of the neurobiology of learning and memory to understand in a more detailed way <clears throat> how to understand these processes and how to uh, develop better treatments. So going back to the startle again, this potentiated startle again, remember we train animals. This is rats again, now we're back to rats. We pair a light with a shock and now we startle the animal either in the absence of the light or the presence. That's fear potentiated startle. If you present now 60 lights, same light that's been paired with the shock, but now without shock, and now you retest, you get a nice decrease going from the pre to the post. It's not forgetting, because if you <coughs> simply expose animals to the context without any lights, there's essentially no deficit. So fear conditioning in rats essentially lasts for the lifetime of a rat. And there's some papers by Michael uh, Fanslow <coughs> that have shown that if you train rats and then you test them about two years later, and the life of a rat is about two or three years, um, they remember it absolutely fine. So fear conditioning lasts forever. If you burn yourself on a hot radiator when you're three years old, you'll never touch that radiator again. It's a wonderful form of learning, obviously adaptive, but <clears throat> that's why we're interested, because 
it's crucial for uh, 